Hello there. Welcome once again to another section from the OpenStax Chemistry textbook. Today we're going to be going over 11.2. This is focused on electrolytes. Remember that we're in chapter 11 right now in which we're discussing solutions of intermolecular forces. We were introduced to the process that things go undergo in order to dissolve, right, in which they have to separate the forces between the solute and the solute, the intermolecular forces between the solvent and the solvent, and then we have to form the interactions that are going on between the solvent and the solute, right? We discussed about that energy process. Now what we're going to be focused on is this concept of electrolytes. Now, uh, we've discussed some of this a little bit in the past. Um, so, electrolyte, what does the word mean? Right, well, electro, obviously, is going to have something to do with electrons or a charge. Right? <coughs> so, what are electrolytes? Electrolytes are things that produce ions when they are dissolved. So, you put them into water. And, or you put them into some sort of a solution, right? And they produce ions, okay? What that, we've got two types of electrolytes that we have to deal with here. So let's go ahead and write this down. We've got electrolytes. These produce ions when dissolved. Okay. Now, we have the two types that were introduced to right here. We've got those that are called strong electrolytes. And these are the ones that completely ionize. So all of the compounds ionize. What do we mean by ionize? Well, we mean that it breaks apart into the charged species, right? All compounds, remember the compounds are combinations of more than one type of element. So what we're saying is something like sodium chloride. What happens when we dissolve sodium chloride into water? Well, put NaCl in, we wind up with an Na plus, NaCl minus, right? This corresponds to that arrow that we talked about all last semester in which would be something like NaCl as a solid, and the arrow goes one way, right? It's going to dissolve, it's going to happen. These things are going to break up. So what does it break up into? Na plus aqueous plus Cl minus, also aqueous. This is sodium chloride and water, making salt water once again, right? Okay, so we've got something that's strong, well, we also have weak. Well, strong and weak acids, remember, strong acids completely dissociate, weak acids do not. Okay, so these have what's known as a partial ionization. Something like this would be um, the acetic acid, HAC as a solid, we can really say that this is going to go from, uh, I don't know if I want to say solid there, H, A, C as an aqueous, but then there's also this idea that it's going to be breaking up into H plus aqueous, and AC minus aqueous, right? So what's happening here? Well, we're first putting it from a solid phase into an aqueous phase. But remember, look at this. This is a whole compound as it is. Then we're saying that this compound is able to break up, it's able to ionize into the H plus and the AC minus. Okay, so. Well, we've got electrolytes, strong and weak. Well, we also have things that do not ionize, right? So what this is going to be called, non-electrolytes. 
guess I could have just attached the non there, but non electrolytes. And what are these going to do? These are not going to produce ions when dissolved. Do not Okay, so how do we tell the difference between these? I mean, we can't get in there and actually look at the pluses and the minuses, right? We can't get in there and zoom in and see what's happening on the submicroscopic scale. But we can use the properties that manifest themselves in their existence, right? In the macroscopic properties that we can actually test here. So, as we're given the idea that this is electro, right, it has to do something with the electrons. Um, electrons are what? The charged species. And so what we have is the, the ability to test this based upon conductivity. Okay, so we can test using conductivity. Conductivity, the ability, the ability for it to, to transfer charge from one place to another. The ability for the, the, the charge to conduct, right? For the thing that you're doing to conduct electricity between one side and the other, right? Pure water, pure water, water that has nothing else in it, no ions, no minerals, nothing dissolved in the water besides just the water itself, is a fairly poor conductor. However, the water you get out of your tap, if you test it using a conductivity meter, you will see that it actually has somewhat of a fairly good conductor, right? You don't want to step in water that is connected to a you know, something like a downed power line or something. Why? Because you'll get electrocuted. Why? Because the water's going to conduct electricity. Why? Well, power line has a lot of electricity for it to conduct. But also, there's other things in the water other than just water. So pure water, fairly low conductivity. We actually use conductivity as a measure of how pure the water is in order to get things like type 2, 8, or whatnot. Um, so, we can test it using conductivity. Well, conductivity, as I've already said, we've got, we're going to have ups and downs here, right? We've got high conductivity. is associated with a strong with a strong electrolyte. Low conductivity is associated with a weak electrolyte. Zero conductivity is associated with a non-electrolyte. Okay, what's next, sir? Well, so we, we've you know, we've got introduced these introduced these concepts. We've talked about the fact that it can conduct electricity, right? And so this is what we're talking about. We're actually talking about the charges being able to move, right? And if you dissolve it and it breaks up into the ions, we then have negatives that can move towards a positive electrode plate and the positives that can move to the negative, right? However, something like acetic acid that has a low conductivity, a low solute, a low conductivity because it's a weak acid, you don't have, you've got these molecules that haven't quite broken up, right? They're still together. We'll talk about this a little bit, um, a little bit later as to why or how we're able to tell how much is going to break up. Okay, so we'll move on down. Talking about ionic electrolytes. So water and other polar molecules are attracted to ions. Well, why? Because they're polar, right? What does it mean to be a polar molecule? It means that you have a partial positive charge in one region and a partial negative charge in another region, right? With water, we've got the partial positives that are along the hydrogen atoms, right? Because we've got that polar bond between the hydrogen and the oxygen due to the difference in electronegativity due to the strong difference in electronegativity and the size of the hydrogen, we wind up with a special type of dipole dipole known as polar bonding, which is even stronger, right? Um, and so 
what we wind up having is the water molecules will orient themselves around these ions that have been dissolved in the solution. So we take the salt, put it into the water, Na plus and Cl minus. Na plus, what's going to happen? Those water molecules, the oxygen side is going to be attracted to it, right? Now remember, it's not bonding to it. We're not creating these new bonds, but we're having the intermolecular interactions occur. Right? So you see the oxygens have moved around such that they're oriented and facing the potassium. Well, at the same time, the chlorine, which is negative, is going to be positively associated with the hydrogens, right? Because they're positive. And so you'll have an attraction in which the hydrogens orient themselves to the water molecules such that they're facing the chlorine. And we can think of this, what's happening as we drop that salt in, right? Well, we've got a crystal lattice structure of positives and negatives, right? And the water molecules are interacting with it. They're breaking their way in and attracting them off, right? Okay. So when these compounds dissolve in water, the ions in the solids separate and disperse uniformly throughout. We've talked about this, right? They're going to disperse around, right? What are we talking about in that? Well, so let me go back just a second and put a definition down. In this, in, we had three types of intermolecular forces that we talked about last chapter. In this subsection here, we're actually going to introduce a fourth type of force that exists here, right? And this is ion dipole. It's an intermolecular force that exists between ion, a charged species, and a dipole, a, a polar species, right? And so that's what this is. This is the electrostatic interaction between an ion and a dipole, a polar molecule, right? Dipole, a polar molecule there. Okay. So we have this word dissociation that I've already used a few times. Dissociation. What does that mean? Well, to dissociate, right? This is the this is the idea of the solvation of ions. So solvation of ions. You know, the ions going into solution. These ions having you know things going around them. This is breaking and forming of the intermolecular forces of these bonds, right? That's what we're doing here. We're tearing the ions away from each other and we're getting them to interact with the dipoles. Okay, solvation of ions. So we can really think of this as, as being, I, I think of it, you know, this, this has to do with that delta H thing, right? We're talking about that energy, those intermolecular forces, the IMFs. Okay, what else do we have going on as these you know, are being plucked off of that ionic solid there? We also have um, dispersion. So this is solvation and dispersion of the ions, the spreading of them out, right? This is, I can think of this a little bit like part of the delta S, right? We're getting these things to spread out, getting more states available for the system to be within. Right? Okay. So, the process is a physical change known as dissociation, right? That's the ions separating from the solid, dispersing uniformly throughout because the water molecules are surrounding them into these little, like, you know, cages of water molecules. And, of course, molecules are coming in and are leaving. It's not that anything permanent is formed. But on average, if you look at a chlorine, you'll have a certain number of water molecules that are oriented with the hydrogens towards it. If you look at one the potassium, you'll have a certain number of molecules that are oriented around it with the oxygens toward them at any given time. Not to say that they're going to be the exact same ones. They will come and go, but on average, you will find a certain number around them. So, what are we talking about next here? Let's go on down. Okay. Talked about that. 
Now we're going to talk about covalent electrolytes. Well, what is a covalent? Covalent is going to be something that, you know, has a bonds, right? It has these covalent bonds. It's just sharing of the electrons, right? So we've got these covalent molecules. And we have these covalent molecules, covalent compounds, that are able to chemically react in order to produce ions, right? Okay. So water is a good example because this one is actually able to auto-ionize. It's able to actually react with itself. So what do we have going on here? We've got H2O and an H2O. This one is giving up a hydrogen to this one, giving us an H3O plus and an OH minus, right? Remember in the chapter about acids and bases, we discussed this, that you have water auto-ionizing forming both an acid and a base. It's taking both roles. It's amphoteric. Okay. Another example of this is we've got something like hydrogen chloride. Hydrogen chloride is a covalent gaseous molecule, but when it is dissolved in water, this is a polar molecule, and when it's dissolved in water, that hydrogen and that chlorine break up, and that's what we wind up with is hydrochloric acid. Okay? And that's going to be able to conduct electricity. So as a gaseous state, it is a covalent molecule, but when it gets dissolved in water, it does uh, it, it does, you know, it acts as an electrolyte and it, dis it dissociates. Okay. So, got a few key concepts. I think we've hit all of these few exercises here at the end. And really, you know, the big things, really, you need to know the difference between a strong and a weak electrolyte. We use these terms a lot and it becomes very important as we move further into our discussion on um, on equilibrium. Okay? And we've got strong things in which the equilibrium lays way, way to the product side. And then we have the weak things in which you can think of it as a little bit more of a balance, right? A little bit more of a seesaw action in which it may lean that way or it may lean this way, right? You may wind up with a lot of reactants and a little bit of products or a little bit of reactants and a lot of products, right? Anywhere in between. Alright, sounds good. I'll see you in the next video.